thank you for joining us on our Entrepreneur's Espresso Journey, uh, where we will discuss local business topics and meet local business owners, entrepreneurs, and influencers. Today's guest definitely has the right entrepreneurial stuff, and we'll meet our guest in just a few moments. This is Stephen Harris, owner of Rivertown Photography and Amplify Your Voice, social marketing for local business. Last week, during our first show, I totally forgot to mention and thank PANJ Radio for hosting the show. Uh, clearly a rookie mistake on my part. So uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Rob Bell and PANJ Radio for hosting hosting our show. And hopefully he forgave me for that. You are forgiven, Steve. Uh, he has spoken. <laughs> he has spoken. PANJ Radio is also an entrepreneurial venture with the goal of bringing local music, news, and other interesting content to the Lambertville, New Hope area, and the world. I also want to thank Russell Norkovich for the theme song, one of our local musicians. Um, actually, it might be appropriate for our guest today, our musicians, entrepreneurs, perhaps a discussion for another day, although I'd probably say they are. So, let me start off to say, what is an entrepreneur? We know that, we know espresso is, a small cup of highly caffeinated energy. Entrepreneurs are highly caffeinated people with the energy to hustle and make their business happen. But let's turn to Wiki for a second. An entrepreneur, I'm just gonna read this off a piece of paper here. An entrepreneur is a person who has possession of a new enterprise, venture, or idea, and has assumed significant accountability for the inherent risks and the outcome. Wow, sounds very legalese, but uh, entrepreneur is a term applied to the type of personality who is willing to take upon themselves a new venture or enterprise and accept full responsibility for the outcome, whether it's successful and they should get the rewards for that, or if it fails, oh well, you know, and they probably learn from it and move on. A French economist is believed to have coined the word entrepreneur first in around 1800. The word derives from the French entree to enter and prende, which I'm totally messed up, I'm sure, to take. And in a general sense applies to any person starting a new project or trying a new opportunity. How many of us have, have a great idea but do not carry it forward for many reasons? Um, I I've, have a whole drawer full of business ideas and, and a few of them I do actually pull the trigger on and, and most of them sit in a drawer. And risk and fear of a major, of ma f fear and risk are a major deterrent to becoming an entrepreneur. Losing your savings, giving up a good career. A lot of people start off working in corporate America and they come up with this idea and then can you give up your 401ks? Um, just not knowing or, and this happens I think a lot, just not knowing how to start. You know, if you don't have an entrepreneurial background, what's step one? I got this great idea, what's step one? Uh, when I was just starting out in the corporate world, and I was an executive for ADP, but I also, my first, my first job was with Nabisco Brands in New York City. Um, all my friends were corporate people. Uh, I think our mission when I, when I graduated from grad school was climbing that corporate ladder. Um, that was what we strove for. We thought, okay, and I thought I'd be at Nabisco really for the, my, my whole life. My father was at Exxon for 35 years. That's what, I, that's what I grew up with. I grew up with the idea that you started working in a corporation and you'll retire there. Mm, it didn't work out for many reasons, and that's fine. I'm really happy the fact that it didn't work out. Um, today, uh, some still seek that safe harbor uh, of a corporate career, although I don't know how safe it is, um, you know, with you know, with the risk of actually being laid off or your company's being bought out and stuff. So while others strive to be the next Facebook or even Snapchat with its incredible $16 billion valuation, Snapchat, $16 billion. If you don't know what Snapchat is, it's a, it's a video communication service. It has just a quick 10 seconds of, of communication. It's, it's definitely in the teens uh, area uh, for usage, although at Amplify Your Voice, we are looking at how we would use that um, to... Uh, market local businesses, but $16 billion? <laughs> Where's the money coming from? Um, however, if you create or buy a local business with the idea of making it a destination, or offering a unique product or service, you too are an entrepreneur. Even if the business is valued slightly less than $16 billion, uh, I think our guest still fits that definition, although, I don't know, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's worth $16 billion. Um, one other thought before we meet Steve. And it is relevant to our guests as well. Uh, entrepreneurs often have incredible backgrounds, are involved in so much business activity. Uh, some, are building, some of these are building blocks leading to their current venture. Time spent in a corporate role, um, a, music, uh, a music producer, 
or previous venture, such as starting a winery. Hmm, I wonder who that is. Uh, how does being a music promoter and a winery owner lead one to be the owner of a well-known destination in New Hope, The Raven? Let's find that out. So our guest today on PA and J Radio and Entrepreneurs Expresso is Steve Lau. In 2015, only six months ago, I was kind of surprised that I thought it was actually under his leadership for a little bit longer, Steve bought The Raven, opened in 1979 as a gay-friendly bar and hotel, and has become a tradition in New Hope. I think that's one of your taglines. The Raven offers fine dining. I've experienced that. It's awesome food. Classy old wood-style bar called The Oak Room, a hotel, a pool, and a new entertainment center called The Raz Room. Mm. Like Raz Room. Uh, Steve also owns a West Coast winery, and as I found out just recently, was in a band, uh, worked for Warner Brothers. He'll tell you all these things. It was a, it's very, very cool. And, he, and he's also been recently appointed as a board member of the Greater Lamberville New Hope Chamber of Commerce. And we'll talk about that as well. So, hey, Steve, I want to welcome to our show. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Awesome. I mean, this, when I looked at your bio just a few minutes ago, I, was, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a really wonderful, circuitous route from being a musician to working at Warner Brothers to taking 20 months off. You'll tell us about that, just traveling around. Um, and then also would like to know also what brought you to New Hope. So why don't you introduce yourself? Why don't you tell us, the radio listeners here, who Steve Lau is? Okay. Um, hmm. Where to start? I mean, I know. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I grew up in Hershey, Pennsylvania, not too far from here, about, I guess, three hours from, from here. And um, growing up, it was always my dream to, um, to live in New York. My parents were both uh, musicians. My mother was a high school music teacher and English teacher. And, um, and as long as I can remember, it was always my dream to live in New York City. So as soon as I um, was able to, I made that move. Um, I started a band when I was in the ninth grade. Um, this is a funny story. My, our, our parents, all the band members' parents, sang in the church choir together, and we were all we all went to the same church. Uh, so we started a band in my basement, and um, ultimately we got signed to to Sire, Warner Brothers Records, home of Madonna and Depeche Mode, and all of our a lot of our favorite bands. Actually, not Madonna necessarily it wasn't one of our favorite bands, but a lot of the alternative acts during that time were signed to Sire Records, and um, and like I said, then from there I moved. I moved to New York City, and um, and I was there for almost 30 years, and um, about. 17 years ago, I bought a place in outside of New Hope in Carversville as a weekend place and uh, was coming out here for weekends, which then became long weekends and ultimately um, became my full-time residence. And then I sold my apartment in New York City about um, two years ago to live out here full-time. Okay. So I'm a Pennsylvania boy at heart, um, ended up back here after, uh, you know, kind of living a, f a few different places around the country. Mostly New York. Mm -hmm. I was in California for a couple years, um, starting the winery. Um, so yeah, I mean that's I guess in a in a broad nutshell, <laughs> that's kind of how I ended up here. So uh, oh, uh, actually, you worked for Warner, so you did have a corporate career at one point in time, though. I, I did. So so we started the band, like I said, when we were in ninth grade, and um, I was pr I was the business guy in the band. I was you know I was the one that kind of had this I mean completely naive vision of getting us out of and for me uh, you know the band represented a vehicle to get me out of Hershey Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and into the bigger world so um, I, I you know I believe that we had something great again I, I mean we were very very young 19 years old um, I was 21 when I got signed and um, I mean, it was just blind naivety that kind of like directed me to call. I, I picked, literally picked up the phone and started calling New York managers, dialing record labels, sending packages in the mail, and just relentlessly kept calling people to try to get our band heard. And then we we got a manager in New York City, and then we ultimately got a publishing deal and a recording contract. And um, and we did really well on the alternative charts. Now, this was back in the beginning of when alternative music was actually alternative to something, which, uh, you know, when we, when we started the band, um, I remember it was one of those first weeks that Billboard just started their alternative music uh, charts, and there were 22 radio stations on the alternative panel. Mm -hmm. 
that whole format went from you know 22 stations in its first week to about 350 at its peak and then has come all the way back down all the way through like you know the Depeche Modes and then the Nirvanas and all of that but it became you know alternative became the flavor of the minute for a very long period there in the mid late 90s um, so we had some some minor success we were on MTV and we did the we toured the country about eight times and you know, did all of that stuff. We actually had a number one record on the alternative charts with one of our songs. But um, yeah, that 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 it, we, I was with the band for three records. Then, like I said, I had been doing it since since ninth grade. And um, by the ripe old age of you know, I think twenty six, <laughs> we had our creative differences. And um, I, our first record did did really well. Our second record did not as well. Our third record and. And like I said, I, I was more the business guy in the in the band as well. I played keyboards and saxophone okay. um, and helped write write the songs. But I was um, I wanted to start a record label at that point. I wanted to produce other people. So um, having built relationships from being in the band with people at our label, the president of our label, who was kind of my mentor, a guy named Seymour Stein, who signed all of these hugely famous people, like I said, Madonna and Depeche Mode and the Smiths, the New Order and the Cure and everybody. Um, he gave me a shot, basically. He gave me a shot and I mean, I was relentless again in terms of like bringing him bands and, and getting meetings with him and, and trying to get things signed. But um, we started out the record label, which is me bringing bands to Warner Brothers and then they would sign them. And then ultimately it became, um, you know, five, 10 years later, it was us um, signing the bands and marketing them and having a staff of about 20 people. And then um, the idea was we would get bands to a certain point, 100,000 records, 150,000 records, and then we would, um, you know, transfer them into the big Warner Brothers machine. At least that's how it was supposed to happen. Um, so that went well for a while and then ultimately moved over to, to Sony and... Um, I, I could keep going on and on here. You, do you want me to just continue with my whole life story, or do you no, want to do it? This, this is good. This is good. So a couple of things. I mean, you clearly show the entrepreneurial hustle. I mean, you, you were phone calling into New York looking for people to to manage you or to to represent you with your band. I mean, that's mm -hmm. pretty bold. I mean, for a kid in Hershey to be making calls in New York City about their band is, you know, it's out there. And that's and and, and a lot of what the entrepreneur and successful entrepreneurs entrepreneurs need to do is to hustle. Mm. to really mm -hmm. push their business. And you clearly yes. did that right from that ninth, you know, young age of 19. So did you have any business training? Did you have, you, you were doing the business side of it. I heard marketing. Did you? Ever? I didn't. I didn't have any business training. And my training through, I mean, we were young, like I said, when we got signed. So it was, it was purely just, um, like you said, hustling and pushing. And I don't know exactly where that came from. I don't, I mean, um, my, neither one of my parents are really, you know, like that. Um, I, I it just, I, I, like I said, I was kind of, I, I, I knew there was something out there and I knew that I wanted to get out of Central PA at the time. It's like I said, it's so funny that I ended up back here, but, um, you know, I was looking, um, and I, and I loved doing the music as well. I mean, we were artists and, but, but I, I viewed it as a way to, um, you know, just get out of, of where I was. And I, and it, I wasn't shy about picking up the phone. And that's something I think has carried on into my adult life. I mean, I really don't, um, my, my tolerance for, for risk or, um, or, um, being shy. It, I mean, it just, I, I just, I don't, it doesn't really exist. I mean, it does. It does sometimes, I guess. But um, you know, I, that, I think that's probably that was probably my biggest asset through that period was just pushing, pushing, pushing. I no, wonder, yeah. And, I wonder. and knowing that I had something to believe in, that I believed in, that I could push forward. I mean, that's that was the basis of it. It wasn't just you know, um, pushing for, without having hopefully you know any background behind it. So you have to have a. I mean, you have to have a passion for what you're doing. It'll come across when you try to well, that's do your it. hustle. You know, yeah. if you really don't believe in what it is you're selling, I doubt you'll be selling it very long. So, right. And it's right. interesting. Another another topic for another discussion someday will be this whole idea of being shy or introverted and the amount of risk you take. Um, in my corp, when I started off, and, and you don't know me well enough, but I mean, when I was in my corporate career, I was very introverted. So, uh, you know, I, may, I, I bridged that gap by happenstance at some other point in time in my life. But, you know, a lot of things that I had ideas for, I'd never pulled the trigger on. But then mm. I came from more of being more 
back office as opposed to front office. So that would be interesting to thing to see, but you were clearly you know, didn't follow it. So you left the music industry, though. You, from what I'm reading in your bio, you were you did some stuff with Warner and then Sony, and then you stepped away. Is, is, is that the? I did, I did, and that was during a time. Um, so yeah, I transitioned from the band into Warner Brothers, and then um, it was a, it was a joint venture with Warner Brothers. I owned fifty percent, they owned fifty percent, and then my deal with Warner Brothers came up, and. Um, I was able, and through that whole period, I mean, at Warner Brothers, we had multiple um, uh, CEOs and head of the music divisions and all of that. And 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 my contract coming up coincided with um, the entrance of a of a brand new CEO for Warner Music Group, and a lot of my people had left. So it gave me the opportunity to kind of look around. And and Sony BMG was very interested in the label at that point. We signed a deal with them. They basically bought Warner Brothers half of it and and agreed to keep me on and, and run the business, and we were able to beef up our staff and everything. And then shortly after that, about two or three years later, um, the industry began to just disintegrate. And um, at that point, I mean, we, we started out... The label started out signing a lot of um, like alternative jangly, I call it jangly English pop music, the kind of stuff that I liked. But what we got really known for, because during this period was um, a lot of, you know, alternative became huge and the real alternative, at least from where I was sitting, became this underground dance music scene. And, um, you know, I'd be working with artists and, and in this guitar world, which again, I mean, I've always liked all types of genres of music, but I, I felt like the real alternative thing was happening at the raves in England in like the mid nineties and like out in the fields in the desert in California and that kind of stuff. And nobody was signing that stuff at the time. And it was, I was just, it was an extension of what I was into and what I was feeling, but we were able then to sign a lot of those things that nobody else was looking at. And then when that whole wave came around, we were perfectly situated because um, we had the catalog and nobody else had been signing that type of stuff. So what? Um, while we had moderate success with a lot of guitar bands, um, we got really well known. And if you don't really, if you're not into the dance music scene, you probably don't recognize a lot of these names, but like Paul Oakenfold or Faithless or... Um, Sasha and Digby, these were the biggest DJs at the time, and they were the first wave of what they call the superstar DJ. And that's what put the label Kinetic on the map, and that's what Sony BMG was really interested in. They wanted to get into that market. That's why I was able to do that deal with Sony BMG. Now, with that said, a lot of our... Um, because it was dance music, it was um, you know a lot of high-tech... Mm-hmm. We our our audience was the first one to um, start migrating towards downloading, and it, it literally became a point um, at which you know we, we I felt like we knew the market very very well, and we were not meeting our numbers, um, our quarterly numbers because you know our sales were dropping off because nobody was buying yeah. CDs anymore, yeah. and we were right at the front end of that, and it was happening of course across the board. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I remember having arguments. You know, nobody, nobody in the music industry was even admitting that there was an issue with any of the downloading or any of that, and that happened for a very long time. And um, so, that's ultimately why I left the music industry was because, um, well, it's, it was actually twofold. It was, it was because the business was kind of deteriorating, and and um, then Sony BMG went through a lot of changes, and they had a new CEO, and they came to me and said do you want to sell your portion of the company Mm -hmm, to us? And at the time, I'll tell you, it was the hardest decision that I ever made. I mean, I felt like a complete failure after building this company for 12 years. And and I always joke, like, looking back now, knowing what I know, I mean, six months later, I would have had to pay them to take this company away. I mean, it was like... Timing was perfect. Timing of... Well, it could have been more perfect if it was even earlier. But it's funny how when you're you're in a moment like that... (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You're in a moment like that... um, you know, you can you can get caught up in the emotion of the you know this is what I've been, yeah. but but it but sometimes it is it is better to just walk away from a situation because um, little did I know the value would have you know, been nothing you yeah. know even a year later for the catalog that Sony was willing to buy and and give me a little breathing room to like take some time off for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. So that so, and, and so and so you you took that time and I mean just. In, in, it, like what did you, you you went off for like twenty months and just like well yeah so one I mean one it was I mean again I felt like I said at the point I was like okay the company record company is not doing well I felt a little bit like a failure and the hardest part of my job at that point was like um, 
dealing with the artist who's the, the, it was their lives and their hopes and their dreams and everything and having been an artist I always felt like I was an artist guy you know first and foremost and that's what I think drove my success as a label person because I was one of the music guys so I know how to talk to artists and I was talking from my heart and I was being real with them but to watch everybody's I mean, not only my hopes and dreams with the label, but like watch their careers from getting signed to thinking that the, this is, you know, the be all end all to watching their faces when they can't find their records in the record stores and yeah. going on tour. And it's just like you get I got to a point where it's like it was really hard to see that happen over and over again. So I was ready for a break and I didn't know what my next step was going to be. Um, I, I looked at where I was and I thought I'm probably not going to have another opportunity for a long time, like I have right now, because I have no idea what I'm going to do next. Like I said, I, I, I didn't make tons of money when I sold the label to Sony, but I had made enough that I could take a little time off and, and then get back into something else. And, um, and so you had no idea what you wanted to get into? No idea no whatsoever. Clue. No, nothing. No clue and, and part of this whole journey going out after the record label was I'm going to find something that I can feel passionate about. And um, my only rule, like going on this journey was if I find a place that I really like there's going to be no rules other than like I'm going to hang out for a little while there's no like if I if, say I go to Goa India or something and I like it there I, I'll stay f until I'm ready to move on for this two-month period of time so I ended up going to the first and I thought what better way to start this whole journey than to do a one month long complete silent meditation retreat so I went to the mountains of um, Colorado and um, entered into this silence and did it. And, and I ended up staying at this place for almost a year, for eight months. Wait, wait. <laughs> not, in, not in silence the whole time, but it was such a rich experience for me. I'm glad I didn't inter interview you then. <laughs> right. yeah, exactly, exactly. So tell me about... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, that's just mind boggling. I mean, I, for one of, the, one of the things that really kind of drew me to that was like, what is the, I mean, what is the scariest thing that I can imagine, you know, within reason? And I, things like jumping off cliffs for me never really appealed to me or like climbing a mountain, which I, I it's amazing to, to, to see people that do that. For, for me, it was just like to actually shut up and be quiet for, for a, um, you know, a month. What, what's going to go on in my head mm -hmm. during that time? And, um, it was pretty, it was it was fascinating. I mean, it was it was definitely mind boggling in its own way. So you had, but it, but it gave you your your mind clarity. You you basically could like push the reset button on your life. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And it's interesting that the phrase that I thought was interesting that you know is also worth exploring is finding your passion. Usually, passion sort of just comes at you. But I guess you were left, you know you could use that opportunity to be looking around, picking up rocks and things like that, and seeing if you can find some passion underneath. So. So um, we got about another minute left on this segment, and so at the end of the day, you 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 did well. Like a lot of us, you discovered wine, I guess. Right, right. <laughs> I guess after being silent for a year, it's that's a good. That's it's a good funny. Time. Well, yeah. I I mean, it was I in, during that time. So I went. I did the whole thing, and then you know, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to hang out here for a while on the mountain and do this. And then it was like, okay, I'm going to go to Europe and travel around, and and um, I think the whole wine story is probably longer than. 40 seconds at this point so we might <laughs> well it's well you know what we you know it's part of it's part of who you still are because you have the wine company I still do. I and do. of course the raven so um so let's let's you know what we're going to do is we're going to then uh, we're going to start to fade out as they say i guess in radio talk and we'll come back on the second half and the second half we'll kind of come back after that journey of 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 being you know in silence for a while and traveling around and finding your passions and then where you are now of course and we'll talk about the raven the, we'll talk about volta wines and, and a little bit about the chamber and whatever else comes up so perfect um, awesome this was a great first half and we'll stay tuned for the second great thank you This is Pat Foran and Zach Romano here at PANJRadio.com. When I have time, I'm hanging out here at the studio with the Shack Radio Boys.
PANJ Radio serves Mercer, Bucks, and Hunterdon counties and the world, and we want to serve your business on our airways. Commercial rates start at just $50 for a 30 second spot on your favorite PANJ show. We run your ad not just once, but up to seven times in a one week period. That's a lot of bang for your buck online. We will track the number of listeners your commercial gets so you can measure how many new customers you get from airing it with us. For more information, please contact Rob at PANJRadio.com or call 609-460-4550. We can't wait to bring your company new local business on PANJ Radio. Join us on the first Thursday of each month for Network Lambertville in Lambertville, New Jersey, the most productive open networking group in our area. At Network Lambertville, we serve award-winning wines this month from La Vie, importers of fine Italian wines from Sicily, a fully catered meal created by Bitter Bob's Barbecue of New Hope, Pennsylvania, and fabulous desserts by Podge Cakes of New Hope. Network Lambertville is held at Green Birdie Productions Green Screen Studio at 21 Bridge Street in Lambertville, New Jersey. Networking with wine and past appetizers starts at 6 p.m. with dinner served at 7.30 p.m. All networkers get one minute with microphone to talk about their business to the group. There is no fee to join Network Lambertville, but we do ask for a $20 tax-deductible donation at the door to help cover expenses. Network Lambertville has over 450 members, but we do limit attendance to the first 50 guests. So please log on to www.networklambertville.com now to sign up and for more information. See you at the next Network Lambertville on Thursday, February 4th, starting at 6 p.m. Two, one, two, three. December promise you gave unto me. December whispers of treachery. December clouds on a covering me. December songs no longer I sing. December no, promise you gave Don't unto me. About. December whispers of treachery. December clouds on a covering me. December songs no longer I sing. This is Tony from Aberration, and you're listening to PANJ Radio. Don't worry about, don't think aloud. Turn your head. Okay, welcome back to Entrepreneur Espresso with Steve Lau from the Raven, Volta, and so much more. So um, it was interesting during the break, we, we, we talked a little bit about money. Um, you know, a lot of things we've heard from Steve, he had strong persistence, he had a hustle, he had a, he had a reason for wanting to get out of, out of Hershey and get into New York City. That was his passion and his dream, to go to New York City, and, and he, found that, he found that avenue through making calls and, and, and getting into the band. But while we were talking, you know, money wasn't really a, a motivator. Um, so, and you were telling me the story about your mom and, 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 and maybe some of the, the financial aspects of your persistence up until that point. So, you know. Yeah, I, th I think what I was trying to say was I had, uh, throughout this, I, I think because I didn't, you know, my parents, like I said, got divorced when I was 11 and my mom was a school teacher and there was a lot of like uh, conversation about we don't have the money for this. I mean, w let me just say though, within that, my mom was great about like taking us on trips to New York or this or that with what little means we had. And she kind of was able to show me the world out there. But, um, you know, the whole, the underlying um, storyline throughout my whole, from 11 to like graduating from high school was we don't have the money. So I think in some ways that drove me to try to get 
to a place where I wouldn't um, not have the money to be able to do the things that I wanted to do. Um, but it also uh, created a very um, high tolerance for being able to, um, you know, survive with with very little. And and I look back on numerous periods in my life when um, I was able to, um, you know, skid through and and um, survive on a lot less than my peers and people around me. I mean, whether it was right or wrong or crazy or not, I mean, I, you know, if, if there if there is an an end in sight or a perceived end in sight, at least I, I can bring it way down <laughs> to like survival mode <laughs> to, to try to get over that hump. And I think that's a big thing because a, a lot of people, you know, a lot of my friends and a lot of are just like, you know, I don't know how you can, you know, bring it down this low to, to kind of go back up. But um, again, I don't know where that comes from. That, yeah. uh, that uh, Well, you live like that. That's how you, you know, after your mom was divorced. So you, you maybe that's it. Yeah, you you're know, right. And, yeah. and I don't think, your, your passion to get out of her shit in New York City couldn't have been be about money because you're going to be a starving artist in New York City with a band. So, you know, right. But, but, and I had no idea. I mean, that was, a, you know, you, again, you think you, 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 you get signed and you think, yeah, okay, this oh. is the be all end all. And then I, as I became a music executive, my first conversation I would have with people that we were signing would be like, this is not the end. This is the, this is not even the beginning here. Like, Look at artists that have made something and use us as a side vehicle, as the label. And but you have to create your own career, and I believe that's true now more than ever. Definitely. Yeah, well, With, look at all these companies out there. There's a thousand other companies that are not valued like you know, like Snapchat or, or, yeah. or and there's a million other companies not valued like Facebook. So, but when you come out and you say I've got this great idea for something, you you think. Oh, you know, yeah, I'm going to be the next Snapchat out there. Well, guess what? You and eight thousand other people. So, hey, yeah. let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, let's get into a little bit of the here and now. So you come back from this grand journey, and and I, and I'll kind of sneak it in. You kind of found wine, but but let's before we talk about Malta and also the Raven, just just give me a quick, just a few a few quick sentences on your vision as on being on the board of directors for the um, uh, for the greater Lambertville New Hope Chamber of Commerce because you know you, you are, you're a new business owner just like me I came in and, and quickly got on the board um, so you got on the board what what is your vision as far as your as you as far as you see it as for the chamber well I mean I don't personally have a uh, my own vision in terms of like the the chamber my from a again from a personal standpoint my I, I want I'm excited to be a part of that team that has um, a lot of smart people on the board and a lot of great ideas. And I think we're in an amazing time with New Hope. Again, I, I mean, I came, I came here when I was in college. I went to school in Philadelphia for a little while and then in New York. And um, I remember New Hope being an amazing area to get away for a couple of days from Philly on the weekend. And then, of course, I returned back here about 17 years ago and bought a place. And I've seen the transformation. So I know a little bit about what New Hope used to be. And you hear all these amazing stories about how New Hope was in its alleged heyday. Um, and I've kind of seen how it's headed in a, in a direction over the last 17 years. And I, I think there's never been a more exciting time, at least for me. I mean, it's just it seems like a lot of things are, are coming back around. Um, from a from a business owner standpoint and from someone who's doing music at the Raven and things like that I mean we've got this whole older generation who remembers um, again what they call the heyday of New Hope when it was just um, you know there were five music clubs five dance clubs at any given time and um, you know people would just kind of shuttle from one to another and the whole town I don't want to call it a party town but it was just had this very um, you know, lighthearted, artistic, music-driven um, vibe about it, and and um, I think some of that kind of shifted, and and in a lot of ways, I feel like that's kind of coming back now. And and just in terms of um, the businesses that are that are building right now in, in New Hope, I mean, there's a lot of outside investment, and there's a lot of big projects that are happening. I'm I'm just really excited to be a part of what's happening with it, with what they're calling I guess the renaissance of New Hope. I mean the towns are just so unbelievably beautiful. I mean I'd love that and that's why I was drawn here in the first place. And then yeah. the more you you keep getting below the surface and like we were talking before we went on the air about meeting new people. I mean there's so many 
interesting people here that aren't walking around with a sign like, hey, I used to, you know, be the drummer for the Beach Boys or this or that. But it's like, you, I mean, and that's something I didn't really um, realize about this area until I was living here full time. But I keep meeting all of these great amazing, amazingly interested people. So, I mean, getting back to the Chamber of Commerce, I'm just excited to be working with a lot of like-minded people. Um, you know, I've, I just had my second meeting with the board of directors and um, we're just trying to, I, I think more than anything, get the word out to other people and, and work with the businesses here to create a situation that um, we know exists that I think, you know, a lot of people don't know about necessarily so. yeah and you know what Let, let's slip right into the raven because i mean the, the the raven is a destination uh in in new hope i mean it's you know it, it's a it has a wide very amount of different things like the, you know you are a hotel you are a, in the summertime you have a, the pool club and things going on you have first of all but you have the restaurant and you have the bar you have the entertainment so you're like a whole mega it's a resort man you got a mega complex up there you know, <laughs> it is a resort you know with, with, the, with the pool and everything so what, what, let's talk about the raven you bought it six months ago what, yes what drove you to buy it and what's your vision for it um well, first, I'd like to, I mean, I feel like I'm more than ever, I feel like I am the keeper of the keys and the, and the vision of the Raven for this period in time right now. I mean, it's something that, that has an amazing history that I was well aware of. And um, I am reminded of that every single day of how many, I mean, literally every couple of days, someone says, you know, I meet a couple that's been together for 30 years and they say they've met at the Raven. Or, I mean, there are just so many stories about it. So I really, I feel like I'm one in a, in a line of people that is just kind of the, the keeper of that, that amazing place. Um, I never had any idea that, I mean, I, uh, if you would have told me five years ago that I would be the owner of the Raven, I never would have believed it. Um, because the, the way that, the way that this whole thing happened was because I was looking for a, um, a live music venue out here uh, for the last few years and I looked at a couple properties and um, there's very few places that um, are properly licensed or or could be licensed if there are any that are not licensed that could be licensed to do that type of thing which is you know live music and a liquor license and um, I looked at a few places along the same road there and um, over a period of a year and some seem more promising than others and somebody just said to me well what about the raven and i was like no the raven's too much of its own thing um it doesn't make sense for what i and that was my immediate knee jerk kind of reaction to like no 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 the raven's not right the raven's the raven but the more i looked at it it's like it, it actually is it couldn't be any more perfect for kind of what we were thinking because i think that um like i just said you know the history is there there's a great um, built-in crowd of people that have been going there for a very long time. There's a lot of love for that place. Um, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, people have a lot of memories. People, uh, you know, have used to eat lunch there all the time. Um, I, uh, that's another thing. I mean, every single week people say, oh, the Raven. I used to go there every week for lunch. You couldn't get a reservation back in the 80s and the early 90s. Um, that challenge is exciting for me because we, you know, we're bringing on some new people in the kitchen. We're working with the same staff in the kitchen. We have a new front of house guy. So I want to bring the, that part of it back to what it was. But I also want to combine, um, you know, or we want to combine the uh, live music venue basically. And we're going to be doing some construction um, starting in a couple months um, and extending the front and, and going in another direction. And, having nationally touring bands come in. We're working with the Raz Room, who has um, a huge cabaret following and some great artists coming through. So there are, and I, the other thing I didn't realize when, when getting into the Raven was that it really is a culmination for me of like, I, I didn't, I knew I was gonna have fun doing this, but I did not have any idea how much fun we were gonna have doing it. And and I, I look at it and I think it's a culmination of um, a lot of different things I've done in my life. I mean, there's the music component, which is obvious, but everything from like what music is playing in the bar to who we're going to be booking in the Raz room with them and like the, and the live bands and everything. So every day is like putting on a show at the Raven. It doesn't stop. I mean, we get to Sunday night and we're like, here we go again. We know we've got a drag show on Monday and we've got like, you know, everything on all every night of the week. But 
you know, there's also the hospitality element with the wine and the service. And that I'm finding myself, that is the most fulfilling thing for me right now where I'm at is kind of like creating an environment that is, um, is, is as good as it can be. I mean, I'm really, you know, I just got done reading the Danny Meyer book called Setting the Table, you know. Um, he started Union Square Cafe in, in the city, but it's all about, you know, I really kind of feel like this is where I'm at in my life, is like, how can I create this situation or how can we as a team make it the best possible experience from dining, to, from the moment you walk through the door there, whether you're there to see Martini Madness on a Monday night in the drag show, or whether you're there to see a Raz Room show, or whether you're there to have dinner. Um, we have so much to work with there, and we've got a long way to go. So, I mean, it's just that that's the challenge that I wake up every morning. I'm really psyched about. And there's no short, I mean, it, there's so, because there's so many things happening there at any given time, um, it, it's never going to get boring. I mean, yeah. there's all these different aspects to it. Do you have a whole marketing so. team? Because on my Facebook, I see you have events like every week. Every, there's something going on. There's There's something to... There's some reason to be there every, every week. Right. I, um, th that, I think, is my value add to, to The Raven, is, is the booking the music stuff and, and, um, and doing. And that's what um, you mentioned Jeff Meyer before we went on the air, who, Je Jeffrey Meyer Gallery. Jeff is my oldest friend in the world. And um, we met early on in, in New York City, like in 1989 or something. But um, that's what we sit in the office all day long and like create you know these try to create experiences then do the ads and put it out on facebook so um and and in between the raven and my former music career and wine i mean that's kind of what i was doing for other people i was acting as an independent consultant to do marketing and create experiential events for people so that's another reason when this came along i'm like I'm, this is what I'm doing for other people. Like I was working for Andre Palaz at the Standard Hotel in New York, and he owns a place called the um, Chateau Marmont in California. So I would be booking the bands for, you know, they're looking, all of these big hotel chains are looking for experiences for their, their people. And um, having done that for a few years, I'm like, why, why don't we just create our own experiences and, and have our own thing and, and do it that. So that's kind of where that came from. So, so it'll be not only the tradition of New Hope, it'll be the experience of New Hope now. So I, I hope so. There yeah. you go. So there you go. You gave me the, the clue there, Jeffrey, because Jeffrey, Jeffrey will be a guest of our show closer to opening up his event, which I'll, tell, which I'll ask you to, you know, to, to share. Um, but Jeffrey, he was probably one of my first mentors when I walked into town here. Um, as I was trying to figure out my way around, you know, who's who, what I should be doing, how I can be helping. And, and I think one of the first things I stepped up and wanted to help him with was with First Friday and things of that nature, mm -hmm. you know. And, and um, you know, you, you got a big gain from him. I'm, I'm kind of oh, sad yeah. to see his gallery closing, you know, uh, you know, on Church Street. But, uh, you know, but just to hear about him, you know, Putting his, his his show on at your at your facility um, again. So so Jeffrey will be a guest closer to the opening of, of his of his um, you know art, art hotel. But why don't yep. you why don't you just give a, a shout out a little bit about what he's doing? Definitely. So the the Raven has fifteen guest rooms, and uh, of which eight of them are part of a um, a guest house. It used to be a place called Cordials, and it's um, the, the Raven is kind of sandwiched between. Um, Bridge Street and Old York Road, and Cordial's entrance is on Old York Road behind it, and um, it's it's eight guest rooms, each with their own bathroom, and um, it hadn't been remodeled since like the late '80s. I mean, it was really like stepping back into a a time capsule, walking into that place, and we were um, we we're selling out the rooms on most weekends. It was like yeah, somewhere between fifty and sixty-five dollars a night, and um, it just it, it just kind of needed a and updating. Um, so Jeff and I had been, um, he had been bouncing around the idea of doing like an art hotel concept. And he was looking at a couple places and it was one of those light bulb moments where we're just like, I mean, like, wait a second, why don't we just, why don't you do that here kind of thing. So um, we are in the process of just um, stripping everything back. It's a beautiful building built in the, we think it's built, it was built like late 30s, early 40s. This is the main Raven building? Or this is the, the, the guest house behind. You know what? I've, I've never seen that. I'm going to have to Yeah, and it's, it's the funny. I didn't even know it existed when, until I did a walkthrough of the property when we first went there. Yeah, so really? okay. so it makes up eight of the, the 15 total rooms. The other seven rooms are in the front there that you see. And um, 
So we just ripped out all the carpeting and took out all the bad furniture and everything. And we just were at the point of staining the floors and, and painting the walls now and doing some other cosmetic stuff and you know all that. And then the concept is he, we're gonna he's going to um, have rotating artists, and every room is going to be like a mini gallery with art on the wall that can be purchased, and or you can just come and and stay in the room. But are, are, but but for the public, because he's used to having a gallery that was open, and people would just walk in and out of his gallery. So in this case too, when the rooms aren't being rented, are you are they going to be open? I mean, how do yeah, how do yeah, people yeah. see that other than short of you know you know renting that room for the you know for the night or weekend? That's interesting. I think, um, and we haven't actually talked about that a whole lot. But th I, th I mean, it would be crazy not to have that be available. I mean, there's some there's common spaces too in the in the hotel. So. In the guest house, so there's the the main room and the kitchen and the dining room and everything. So yeah, I mean we're we'll always do openings as well. So we'll do events there yeah. and and things like that, so that people can come see the. I mean that's the whole idea is to get artists in front of people. So there will definitely be that element to it and make Raven more of a destination. Right, so, exactly. Wow, I got even more stuff going on. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky, lucky to be working with great people like Jeff. Yeah. You know, and that's another thing. I mean, I keep, I, you know, I, 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 it may not sound like I don't like to talk about myself, but I mean, this is <laughs> this is all really being made possible by the amazing people that I work with. I mean, it's a great management team that I walked into at the Raven, and they're phenomenal. And I just like look at the team that we have, and I feel so lucky to be able to. And I think any entrepreneur, I mean, you can have an idea, you can, you know have all the drive in the world, you can have the, the guts to pick up the phone and call anybody. But if you don't have, that is one thing that I've always had, whether it was the record company or whether it was the wine company or this, I mean, the, it, it's not just one person. I, I know what my weaknesses are and I think that like, you know, I, I, I had a great general manager at the record label and none of that, none of our success would have been obviously been possible without that. And I think more than ever, I realized that so much of what I want to do and what I think is being successful is putting together the right team and having everybody have a, a sense of ownership in what you're doing. I mean, it's really that, that what I look at now, my mentors, that's, I think what they did the best was being able to identify talent in other people and bring them into the fold. I mean, that's where you're really going to. Do you have a mentor now? Um, I should ask you. So you've had mentors in, in your past that different keep. I've right? I've had mentors in my past that have made all the difference in the world. I do not have like I'm. I feel like I'm kind of out and like I said. I mean, I just no. I mean, I have people that I look own. up. I just read read the Danny Meyer book, for, and from a hospitality standpoint, I think that he kind of hits the nail on the head in terms of his approach and his philosophy to hospitality and service. I think that is it. I don't know him, so I don't can't I certainly can't call him a mentor, but. I would not be where I am today without um, a guy named Seymour Stein, another guy named Howie Klein. <laughs> Sound like you know to, uh, a lot of um, music business type names there, but th they both took me under their wing and kind of um, you know helped me and and help, kind of shepherded me through the music industry. Yeah. So. Well, maybe you're becoming a mentor. Yeah. There you, you go. Know. Maybe. Now the tables have turned. You know. So. So hey, so let's let's just briefly talk about um, two. Well, just talk, you know, we know about the winery. We'll 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 put the links up on the page there. Yeah. Um, we got yeah. So uh, actually, we have a few moments. So let's just share a little bit about your winery. Uh, that's out on the west coast. Right. So uh, so uh, th after the that came before the whole the, obviously just from a timeline standpoint that came well before the the Raven and and such. it came yeah it came along. So the the, the I, I did my little getaway thing and like literally on the road after like the meditation thing and you know going out through Europe just kind of like an idea would come to our come to my mind and I'd be like okay maybe I could you know maybe this is the next thing or that is the next thing and then at one point it was going to I'm like oh we can set up um you know massage stations in um all the airports which of course came to fruition <laughs> but I asked myself I'm like I don't think I could do like I don't think I could travel from airport to airport like monitoring like you know massage what other parlors ideas, what other ideas like that. did you did you, did you think you had that you just oh, kinda... there were some and I'm trying to think what they Anything that's really crazy that you kind of maybe there were some and I'm, I, I, I didn't even think about this because yeah. I probably could have um oh, I'm not going to be able to yeah. remember them okay. right now but the um 
the wine thing, we were, I was visiting a friend that I knew from New York who lived in Amsterdam, and we were out one night, and um, he is he's a he's a crazy fun, amazing person with a crazy story. He's actually like, I mean, he's a he's a prince of Kuwait, and his name is Al Zaba, Sal Al Zaba, and. Um, so we were out one night with him, like having dinner, and he was buying us dinner, and he kept ordering this amazing champagne at at dinner, and it was a salon, 1986, and you know I, for, I forget what the moment was, but I'm like, you know what? I really, my dad was always really into wine, and I had an expense account when I worked with Warner Brothers, so I'd go out for dinner, and if people knew, kind of, I, I learned, was able to kind of educate myself to a certain degree with some Warner Brothers, you know, expense account money and stuff like that. Um, and it's always something that fascinated me. And, and, and at that point in time, it touched all the right things for me. It was like from the earth, then it was we were going to do organic, which was always very important. And it's something that we could create. And I was able to bring my branding knowledge to it. And I was able to like put together the team of the winemaker and the vineyard manager. And, and it just kind of touched, like I said, on all the things that I really like to do. Um, so I came back and I realized, yeah, okay, I know what I like. I think I know a little bit about wine, but I'm by no means qualified to like start um, a winery. At first I wanted to import champagne, but then that was something that I, that the more I thought about that, it's like, why would I build somebody else's brand and not own it? And that's something I had learned from the music industry. It's like, okay, so I'm not gonna import champagne and build somebody else's brand so that they could go to another distributor. I'm just going to start my own thing. Again, this is just ridiculousness. But so I went to wine school. I, I knew that I didn't know anything or enough about wine and picked a school in the Napa Valley, the Culinary Institute, and went there and did that for um, eight months, lived in the Napa Valley and went to school. And, um, and then just, again, hit the ground and like, okay, I'm going to need to find a winemaker. I need to find a vineyard manager. And I did the branding and, the, and actually Jeff hand, helped with the label and everything. And I knew what we, and we communicate well. So I'm like, okay, this is what, exactly what I'm looking for. And he understood it completely and made it happen. So now I see, I learned who, who your marketing genius is now. Yeah, absolutely. A marketing background. So, yep. so, but how's it, I mean, but you run it sort of an abstention now because you live here and it's out there. So. Yes, but yes, that's, I, I do. guess about and a I good learned, team of people. And and the one thing I learned from the the, the wine thing was that um, you know we make we got very very lucky. Our our first again this sent our first bottle to Wine Spectator, and we get a ninety three in Wine Spectator. Boom, you know, first, and our winemaker is like your first, first vintage. Five that. That's nice. Yeah, yeah and our winemaker is like you know people work their whole lives for this type of thing. And again, yeah. you, hit a whole, you hit a whole, and we're like, wow, That's like we made 300 who, who cases. Stands up at the plate and hits a home run on their first, on their first. It was crazy, time, so. crazy luck. Yeah, total luck. And that things like that, you know, scoring wines or scoring music is so arbitrary. So I, you know, we got, we got lucky with that. Um, I do think the wine is great, but you could have a great wine and get, you know, an 85 on it. Um, so uh, we were making 400 cases, 500 cases of expensive wine, $70 a pop, got a great score, and I'm living out on the West Coast. And um, it was just, it, I, I realized through that whole experience, like I really like the branding and I like the creative aspect of it. But with, with, a, with an amount of wine that small, um, my life had to be going on the road and selling this wine and becoming a salesman and moving cases. And while I enjoyed doing wine tastings and things, um, I quickly realized that, you know, the, my fantasy of, um, y you know, retiring in the Napa Valley and living on a vineyard and, and then going out and, and, um, selling the wine, it just, um, I feel like I knew what I did. My part in that, I, I, what I do best kind of had been done. So how do we grow the company from there? And, and, the, and the answer was finding a really, really great salesman. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. We're at a point where we have to make a decision like, you know, do we want to stay in this 700 to 1,000 case thing? And, and let me tell you, not make any money because you're putting money in now that you're going to see a return on three and a half years later. Like, how do we move to the next thing? And that involves a lot more overhead investment. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> The man has a lot going. <laughs> the man has a lot going on right now. So, but I, I'm, yeah. I'm, hey, listen, Steve, we're gonna wrap wrap things up. But we, I mean, this 
Ha having Steve here also exemplifies what we want to talk about on Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur Express. So just the idea that people do take risks. They're persistent. They have a little bit of hustle. They, have, they keep the idea of money uh, real. Um, it, it, money will come for the people who don't plan for it in, in advance. Um, I'm sure he's not living on, uh, on noodles right now. So, um, so I want to I want to thank Steve for for being a guest on my show today, and I want to also thank, thank PA you. NJ Radio, uh, so that uh, I don't have that food pie again. And we'll have another show next week, another business leader in town. And um, thank you once again for listening to our little show in, in Lambertville, New Hope. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. Steve. Thank you.